Morning, good afternoon, good evening everybody. Welcome to today's CPG Masterclass Series webinar, The Art and Science of Wedge Play with Stephen Orr. Before we do get started, as always, just a couple of housekeeping rules. If you could just make sure that all your microphones are muted, you are more than welcome to keep your screens on if you want to, but again, you can turn those off if you want to as well. We will be recording this webinar and uploading it onto the Masterclass Hub page after this session is concluded. So, for example, if you missed something or uh, didn't quite hear something, you're more than welcome to go back on to the uh, Masterclass Hub page and review it all. We'll also allocate a bit of time after, the, after Stephen's finished presenting for a short Q&A. So, for, say, for example, you have a question, if you could just please post your question into the chat option in the bottom of your screen, and I will uh, coordinate a Q&A and answer, ask the questions to Stephen and he'll answer them and hopefully we'll get through as many as we, uh, we possibly can. I'm Tom Bentley, I'm the Communications and Event Manager for the Confederation of Professional Golf. So once again, welcome all. And I'm going to hand you over to Stephen Orr. He has been a coach for over 15 years and he's worked with European tour players, national, co uh, national squads and various players of high profile and he's going to be speaking about the short game today, the art and science of wedge play. Stephen. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks for, for taking the time out of your day. Um, I was going to say thanks for taking time out of your busy days, but uh, if you're like me, your days are probably uh, not that busy at the moment. But um, I hope everyone's safe and well. And um, yeah, hopefully we can uh, get ourselves back out onto the uh, golf courses fairly soon. Um, Tom, I see there's a few messages already. There may be some guys that can't... Uh, perhaps here. Um, I'm not sure, but I'll just carry on if you want to check the messages. Um, yeah, so I think we're, we're okay, Stephen. We're okay. we're okay. No problem. So the, um, the webinar this afternoon is the Art and Science of Wedge Play, which is a subject I've been uh, studying for about five years now. And normally this, uh, this course is two, two days in length. So condensing it, down a lot into just some some key ideas from those two days uh, into 25 minutes to, to 30 minutes today so um seems to be a lot of people on the call so obviously a lot of people interested in wedge play which is great so in terms of content uh, we're going to look at basic ball and club data of high level players um, a little bit on generally desirable movement patterns in wedge players that um, that i've seen uh, we're also going to look at some research on strike location. Um, you know, what effect does striking the ball in different parts of the, the face of a wedge have? And then some training concepts uh, at the end of the, of the webinar. And where's this information come from? So where's the stuff come that I'm sharing with you this afternoon? So it's come from a, a variety of sources. It's come from studying and coaching high-level wedge players. Uh, some amateurs, uh, some top level amateurs and professionals. Interestingly, some of the amateurs that I've got in my data, I would actually say are better than some of the professionals that I've looked at. Um, 3D data, launch monitor, monitor data, and some robot testing as well. Some research, uh, some interviews with tour players to understand how they became skilled uh, in short game. And also my own game, I think that's something I, I'd stress is quite important is um, the journey I've had in my short game, fundamental to that has been my, the development myself of my own short game skills. I've always believed as a coach that as you get better at hitting the shots that you're trying to get people to do, you get better at coaching it. You see a, a very sort of direct relationship there. So also really just my own findings in my own game. So one of the things I realized quite quickly is that to, to understand something you, you couldn't look at one thing in isolation. So to understand wedge play, I wanted to look at it from a, a complete point of view, a holistic point of view. So just looking at someone on YouTube, a good wedge player and looking at their technique, for me, doesn't give a complete view of wedge play. I've got to look at it from a slightly broader perspective. So the, the key factors for me would be ball behavior, club behavior, body motion, and also motor learning and training environment, environment concepts. So understanding how a player has become skilled beyond just looking at technical elements is also very important. And we'll share a little bit on that at the end of the, the webinar. 
And just a, a quick kind of uh, thought for you. Um, who would you say in, in, in your minds would, you, it would be the best uh, full wedge player, 50 to 120 yards? Uh, and I look over kind of a four-year period rather than just somebody who's, who's been particularly good in one year. Um, and this is purely US PGA Tour. So over a four-year period, um, I can try and move at a reasonable pace. So I'm not going to give you long to think about it. So I would go with this guy, Vaughn Taylor, um, top 20, just about for four years in a row from 50 to 120. So if I could get anyone's data, I'd like to get that guy's data on wedge play. And then from in, in close to the green, um, over a four-year period, I'm going to go with Webb Simpson. So inside the top 20 in scrambling proximity. So would be, for my money, the, the, the number one guy around the greens over the last, over the last four years. And number one will average about six feet from the hole. It's quite surprising looking at short link data that it's not quite as close as you would think, but taking into account the difficulty of the golf courses, um, that's still pretty good on a consistent basis. So looking at ball and club behavior. So these are average numbers of 10 elite wedge players. And I think these are good rules of thumb. They're good guides when we're coaching. Uh, I talk about these quite a lot with players in terms of if they're using a launch monitor certain um, numbers, certain outputs that they should be looking for when they're hitting shots. And I think even as we're developing club golfers, you know, 10, 15 handicappers, trying to get them into these ranges, I've found to be very productive and actually not that, um, not that difficult when we understand the, the elements that produce these shots. So I've left some out today, again, just because of time, but the key ones, first of all, would be spin rate. So what's became quite obvious looking at skilled wedge players was just the, the sheer amount of spin that they put on the golf ball. And you can see here in terms of spin rate per distance, um, at 30 yards, generating 6,000 RPM, 50 yards, 8,000. So very large amounts of spin, 20 yards, 5,000 RPM of spin, and then up to 10,000 at 75 and levels off just past that. So that was a surprise to me when I first started looking at spin rates was just how much spin skilled wedge players were generating and obviously very important for landing on firm greens in the middle of summer and stopping the ball. So a key characteristic would be the ability to generate high amounts of spin. Um, launch angle, again, this was a, a surprise and this is quite a few years old now. Um, so looking at shots from longer than 30 yards, you can see there on that graph that all the shots that I measured um, when all the players were below 30 degrees. So interestingly, there was only, I think, one or two shots in all of that data sample that launched higher than 30 degrees. We often hear the number 30 degrees is a, is a good number to work towards. I would say best wedge players are launching it considerably lower than that somewhere between 24 and 30 degrees. Really quite low, loaded with spin. So that would be your typical, um, that would be kind of typically what a, a good wedge shot would look like. Obviously there's variations in that, but just as a, as a rule of thumb. Dynamic loft, we can see that good wedge players are de-lofting the club considerably. Um, Rob Neal's research showed that Typically, wedge players are de-lofting the club about 15 degrees of impact. And again, it varies a little bit, but again, a good rule of thumb for us as coaches. And that's more than a skilled player would de-loft a seven iron or a six iron or a five iron. So they're, they're de-lofting the club more on wedge shots than they are on, on full shots. And then finally, smash factor. So, you know, the energy transfer from club to ball. Um, so very close to to one, anywhere from 0.95 to 1.1. So um, again, what came out for me from, from that was that skilled wedge players are controlling the energy they transfer to the ball. It doesn't seem to be an ideal smash factor, but consistency of smash, however, is very important. So those would be three kind of, um, or four bits of ball and club data that I think is important to keep your eye on when you're watching, when you're watching wedge players. Um, and trying, you know, these are key numbers that you're perhaps trying to move less skilled players towards. So as an example, this would be a, a wedge shot. This was actually me that hit this one. Um, you can see it didn't go very straight. It went off to the right, but 
75 yards, almost 10,000 RPM of spin. And we can see the ball's launched about 26 degrees, just in line with what I was saying previously. So we can see there that the dynamic loft, this was a 54 degree. I've de-lofted it about 15 degrees to 40 degrees. But if you just have a look at those numbers, the, the delivered loft is 40 degrees, but the ball's launched at 26. So where does that other 14 degrees come from? So if we think about that just for a second, what's the other factor? Certainly angle of attack will have a little bit of an influence on that as well. So what else is causing the ball to launch way lower than the dynamic loft that we deliver to the back of the ball? The answer to that would be friction. So the material, the ball and the club, particularly the club, um, the material that uh, between ball and club has a huge effect on lowering the launch of the ball. So friction is the other big factor in lowering the launch of the golf ball. Um, a brand new wedge using a good quality golf ball uh, is quite incredible, even with average wedge players, how quickly they can start to ramp the spin up and lower the launch. Um, it's quite, uh, quite amazing. And again, was a surprise to me just when I started looking at this, the sheer effect that friction has on lowering the flight of the golf ball. So one of the reasons, not taking anything away from the best players in the world, one of the reasons they can flight these shots is because they've got a brand new wedge in their hand um, near enough every week. So taking nothing away from their skill level. So a quick summary there. So these shots would be hit in my data with between 54 and 60 degree wedge, dynamic loft 40 to 45, hitting down about six degrees, launch angle between 24 and 30, eight to 10,000 spin. So to achieve that, we need good technique and we need very important, we need good grooves and face condition, absolutely critical. So just moving on to basic body motion. So this would be normally half a day's discussion, but all I'm really going to do here is just look at basic, um, basic body motions that you would see in most good wedge players. And there's certainly variations. There's, um, there's outliers in terms of you know, very skilled wedge players, but these would be just be again, kind of rules of thumb, thumb and things that uh, you might say that I like to see in, in uh, you know, players who are trying to improve their wedge play. And the first would be a nice narrow stance to help be able to control where the, the low point of the swing is. And left foot flared. I seem to spend a lot of time trying to get people to flare their left foot out to be able to encourage good body motion. Um, spine angle neutral rather than being typically tipped uh, back away from the target. A very gentle shaft lean rather than excessive uh, address. Left wrist slightly extended or cupped. Uh, just to use kind of golfing terminology and pressure just very gently left but you can see there in that picture there there's nothing excessive in any of those things it's a very natural comfortable setup and then a couple of surprises when you start when i started to look at 3d data when you started to look at uh, skilled players that when the club goes back the head and pelvis are actually moving toward the target and um, not even staying still or moving away from the target. They're moving toward the target. Pressure is an interesting one. So this, the, the mass of his body has moved towards the target, but the overall center of pressure will have moved a tiny bit to the right because of the weight of his arms in the club, but generally staying very steady. Um, and the right elbow just folded gently with a, a nice backswing that's under control. And what's interesting, and this is personal experience, is we use the words shallow and steep a lot. We always talk about wanting our players to be shallow. Um, but when do we deliver, when do we create shallowing elements in our swing? And how do we produce that? And I think a lot of golfers mistakenly try to get the feeling of shallow address. Whereas when I produce these body movements, it feels steep to me at the top of my backswing. So thinking about where we feel steep and where we feel shallow, I think is good from an awareness point of view for people. But that certainly feels like I'm going to deliver the club steeply to the ball from that point and not shallow. The shallowing for me comes, comes later. So coming down through impact, so the head typically in good players would, I rarely would see a good wedge player who lowers and loses height through the ball. Typically they'll gain some degree of height chest and hands are moving at a similar rate, especially close to the green. 
uh, pressure is moved further towards the target, as is the pelvis. So that really sets the body up to deliver the club and land the club on the ground at the right point with that 15 or so degrees of shafting that we mentioned previously. And the thing that stops the club crashing into the ground and the, the shallowness would be a, a degree of um, lifting of the hands through good rotation, a uh, slight extension of the spine. Uh, so those would be the elements that stop the club crashing into the ground. And that's how we get the combination of lean of the shaft but still a reasonably manageable angle of attack. And just talking a little bit about the path of the hands versus the club. So this was a, a game changer for me in terms of my own pitching, um, was being able to differentiate the movement of the handle to the movement of the club. So the hands at this point in the swing are already starting to move up on a slightly narrower arc whilst the club head is still moving down. And the timing of those are very important. One of the things I've, I've found is that the more skilled the player, the better they time those movements. Um, and it's quite a key thing I would say for us to look at on video. You'll often see golfers driving the hands too far for too long at that point when they're hitting pitch shots. And there's a number of factors that influence that as well, obviously. And then just at the finish, pressure's fully left, pelvis is rotated, spine nicely extended. And again, a key thing I see is that with really skilled wedge players, they're never forcing these shots. 30 to 120 yards are rarely ever hit past 70%, maybe for a front, a front pin, but um, rarely beyond that. So that would be a very quick fly through. Um, I haven't shown any variations in technique or different combinations, but those would be just um, general patterns that you would typically see in good wedge players or that I've, I've seen. Um, so the next subject would be strike location and what effect does, does that have on launching wedge shots? So um, I did some research a few years ago with the robot at the RNA's testing center uh, to try and really understand what happens when the ball was hitting different parts of the club face. So you'd often hear that um, hitting the ball lower on the face makes the ball spin more, for example, and it makes it launch lower. So I wanted to test these things and see if they were true. So we did a study in 2016, and all we did was look at strike on the center of the face, five millimeters down, 10 millimeters down, and 15 millimeters down. And what you can see there from that study was that the launch changed only a degree, and the spin rate didn't change at all. So the idea that hitting lower on the face increases spin didn't seem to be the case, which was a surprise. Uh, I expected to see some kind of difference there. So hitting lower on the face will lower the launch angle, um, minimal effect, and hitting lower on the face will make the ball spin more, didn't seem to be the case. So the next question I said was, well, what happens if you hit anywhere on the club face? anywhere at all. So that was the second study that we did a year later. And there you can see we hit every conceivable part of the club face, even off the groove slightly. And you'll see beyond a little bit of variation, virtually no change in spin, depending on where you hit the ball on the club face. So that was a real surprise. Um, a surprise to a lot of coaches when I showed them that as well. So the things that we're seeing on the golf course in terms of spin could perhaps be attributed to other, to other factors. So when you look at some of TrackMan's data from the past, what creates spin? Spin loft, club speed, absolutely. Friction, absolutely. Impact location. So that doesn't appear to be a factor in wedge play as far as, um, as, far as our research, research would show. Um, but certainly the top three uh, would have a big effect, absolutely. So looking at um, just a bit closer to the green, so greenside wedge shots. So on the left, you've got Brett Rumford there, maybe the best exponent of, of short shots. And these are, on the right-hand side, are things that um, I've said to people in the past, I've tried to do with my own game. And the closest I ever came, I think, to having the chipping yips um, was a coaching experience. I was actually encouraged to do it, was to do all of those things on the right-hand side to, to excess. Um, which is not to say if you did all of those things, you couldn't strike and flight a chip. You probably could. Um, but when we do any of them excessively, 
um, I think that's when we start to see golfers who run into problems. Um, if you look at Rumford hitting this shot, he doesn't do any of those excessively. And what um, we did, myself and Rob Neal, is we kind of looked a little bit closer at this. So we, we looked at some chip shots, um, and this first one here would be a delivery where I'm intentionally trying to hit three inches behind the ball. And you'll see my numbers on the right-hand side, attack angle, shaft lean. So modest attack angle, modest shaft lean. Um, so I'm engaging the underside of the club. And the club travels relatively flat for about eight inches. So I'm, again, I'm intentionally hitting three inches behind the ball. And the ball came out just fine, slightly lower in terms of spin, but ran out reasonably close to the hole. And that was about 25 yards from the flag. So you can see there, if I, if I just kind of photoshopped the shaft as it's moving through, there's a nice control of the bottom of the arc and also how steeply the club's being delivered. And then when somebody does any of those things excessively that I showed on the previous page or a couple of slides previously, then you start to see this type of thing for, with players who are really struggling with their, their short game. If they, if they miss the ball to any degree, we start to see that. So the angle of attack is steeper, the shaft lean is steeper, almost to the point where I would say it was unmanageable. There wouldn't be an issue if the ball was struck first, but when it's not struck first, which it often isn't in short game shots, then things start to become um, quite unmanageable. You can see there, as I Photoshop that in, so if the club, if there was no ground and ball and the club continued, it's continuing on a very different um, path. So one of the problems for me with a steep angle of attack is the size, the effect that it has on the size of the arc. Um, so the margin for error in terms of being able to make solid contact or be able to get a workable shot is 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 really quite um, is really quite small. It shrinks, uh, you know, to, to almost unmanageable levels. So I think when we're coaching, being able to find ways to create a manageable angle of attack combined with shaft lean is very important. Which points to a bigger question, um, doesn't it, in terms of the, the yips? And I've got some good friends and colleagues who are studying the yips in chipping and, and putting, and it's a it's an interesting debate, isn't it? You know, is, is it is there a technical cause that creates the yips, or is it more of a psychological cause, or is it a combination? Um, and yeah, and it's just worth one worth thinking about. I don't think I've got any answers here, but I do believe that the technical element has a has a contributing factor. Um, so, yeah, a phrase I like to use a lot is, is surf the turf. So being able to create a reasonably shallow attack angle as well as controlling where the bottom of the arc is. If we can get our players to do that, we can improve their short games immensely. Tom, am I okay for time? Yeah, all good, Stephen. Okay, so that was um, three, four, five hours uh, of stuff flown through very, very quickly. Normally we would be outside and testing that stuff and having a go ourselves, but um, hopefully there's some things there that, uh, that you can take out onto the short game area when we get out of lockdown and uh, you can test out and try yourselves and on your, on your pupils. So just looking at um, some training concepts now. So the first thing I, I'd like to, to think about is distance control. So this is a something I've thought about quite a lot in terms of, well, how do we actually control distance on pitch shots? And the common way that um, I've taught it and I see it being taught would be with um, a real emphasis on placing cones at different distances and thinking about swing length. So swing length obviously relates to club head speed and clock face methods are, are popular. Um, you know, 7.30, 9 o'clock, 10.30. As I say, those, are, those place an emphasis on speed. And one of the things I've noticed is that even with medium level players, you know, mid handicappers, they're actually a lot better at judging speed um, than I realized. So it made me think, well, what are the three factors that control distance? And we've got club head speed, but we also have controlling loft and we also have strike location. So the questions for me then was, well, what effect does strike location have on distance control? What effect does dynamic loft have on distance control? Those things, as far as I 
um, was was aware had never been had never been measured. If you deal off the club two degrees more than you intend to, what effect does that have on distance? Or if you hit it out the toe, what effect does that have on distance? So decided to look a little bit more closely at both of those and not club head speed. So here's a, an example, um, two shots of exactly the same speed. One was moving at 70 miles an hour, the other one at 70.5 miles an hour. Um, both, one flew 22 yards further than the other. So one of them was de-lofted more than the other, the one that went further. And also we can see struck at quite a different point in the, on the club face. So with, a, with a, a golfer in a natural training environment, they're going to adjust their club head speed. They're not going to change their strike or their loft unless they've got a really high level of awareness. They'll always go to club head speed. So I wanted to look closer at those two. So with the robot data, we were able to say what effect does strike location have? So you can see there that at certain points in the club, if you hit it off the toe, for example, somewhere here where my cursor is, that's a 10%, 11% drop in distance. So a swing that would hit the ball 80 yards will only hit it about 70 yards. So a 10, 10 yard drop off if you hit it at the same, at a certain point on the club, more so if you're further over towards the toe. So quite a big effect, especially if you're hitting out towards the toe, rather le much less so on the heel, um, quite a big drop off when you hit it near the bottom of the club as well. So center contact is really, really important. And then loft, um, so just a quote there. So if you can't control strike, you'll be all over the place in terms of distance control. As one of the tour players I interviewed said that, and he's, he's alluding to, to, to what is there on the screen. Um, and that's one of the things I noticed with skilled players is it's like hitting a five pence piece on the club face. And then dynamic loft and carry distance. So sorry for the graph, uh, for all the, the, the numbers, but basically what this showed is we had the same club head speed and all we did was change the loft by one degree increments. So with the same club head speed, um, the least lofted club, least lofted wedge went 100 yards, the most lofted um, wedge went uh, 60 yards. There was a 40 yard difference through the range changing one degree. So one degree change in loft affects the carry distance by three yards on a full wedge shot. So if you go back to the example of the guy who hits it off the toe and adds three degrees more loft than he ideally should, you've got a potential difference of 20 yards there on a wedge shot with the appropriate club head speed. So where does that leave us with distance control? So the way I coach distance control now is I don't put cones out, I don't use club face methods. All I do is spend a lot of time helping people improve their technique and their ability to control loft and control strike in the middle of the club face. And as somebody gets better at doing that, one of the things I've noticed is they say, my distance control is starting to get better, which is very interesting. So my question to you guys as coaches is, I wonder if we are working on distance control from the wrong way around. Rather than thinking about distance, if we think about the variables that are affecting distance first and foremost. So that would be distance control from a training point of view. And then just to finish off, um, skill development. One of the things that I really wanted to understand in wedge play is how, do, how did the really, really skilled players get better beyond just technique? And we've, we've talked a little bit about technique, but beyond that, so I decided to interview some tour players, which is still ongoing. Um, to this point, I've interviewed nine, which is not a big data sample. And those nine players have had 26 worldwide wins, uh, one Ryder Cup appearance. And I just literally just ask them some questions about how did they get better? What did they do to get better? Um, and four things came out of the conversation, actually five things, um, it's four that I can talk about today because I haven't sort of gathered the data on the other one. The, 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 the fifth one is focus of attention and what they, what they focused on while they were hitting these shots. But the four big things were coaching, learning, controlling distance and strike. And when it came to coaching, the, the big thing that was a real surprise was that all of those nine players, none of them had any coaching on short game before they got on the tour. 
So all of their development was essentially self-development. So no coaching at all in short game when I was an amateur. No coaching before I got on tour. None in putting. I don't even remember having a short game lesson as an amateur. So these guys became exceptionally good in an implicit way. It wasn't through huge amounts of coaching. So even if all that, with all that data that I've just shared, they were able to get better um, even when they weren't privy to that information, which, which was a big surprise. In terms of learning, um, a lot of them would say that they didn't ever remember struggling with their short game the way that they did with their long game. It was almost like the depth of learning was stronger with their short game, and perhaps that related to how they how they learned it. There was no mirrors, no string lines. So they talked about play a lot and learning. Uh, one talked about chipping off the green all the time to develop control of low point and control of the bounce and loft. Uh, another player talked about learning in his back garden when he was younger and he had to learn to deliver the club shallow or his dad would give him into trouble for taking a divot out the back garden. So the environment playing a big factor in learning. Talk about copying, trying different lies, different shots, pure exploration. I just explored. And one of the words that they come up with a lot was exploration. So it really made me think that especially around the greens, what can we do as coaches to drive exploration? How can we set up tasks that drive exploration rather than just teaching somebody a technique? These guys seem to get pretty good. Um, these guys and girls, I should say, they seem to get pretty good without all of that technical information, not to say that it's not important. So what does exploration look like? So it's interesting, how would we even set about beginning to teach that technique? Um, and that technique evolved, that young lad, his technique evolved over time. And it evolved because he was trying to solve a problem. So the problem came before the solution. And I think often in coaching, it works in the opposite direction to that, where we're trying to give somebody a technique before they understand what problem it is that they're trying to solve. So before we teach a technique in short game, perhaps we need to set the learner a problem to solve first. Uh, how many of the players used the clock face method? None. Interestingly enough, come go back to some of the things I mentioned before. Uh, also, what was a surprise was that very few of them talked about landing spot as a concept. So I wonder if that's just a coaching concept that's evolved. A lot of the, the elite players that I interviewed didn't really discuss that. I was in, less interested in where the ball lands, more in trying to hold it. Landing spot isn't something I've ever done. I was better at judging distance just by looking at the hole rather than picking a spot. So it made me wonder where did where did landing spot come from? Is it you know a concept developed by less skilled players, uh, perhaps? Maybe the the more skilled players are not doing that stuff. And they talked a lot about controlling strike. So it comes back to what I was talking about with distance control. So there was a big emphasis on learning to control strike. Um, so that data has really made me change a little bit how I coach um, aspiring players. We spend less time with cones out, less times trying to refine. It's almost like refining distance is the icing on the top. It's like the stuff that you have to learn first is the contact and being able to control the loft that we deliver to the to the back of the ball. And they really um, emphasize that quite strongly. And then finally, this is um, Kevin Na talking about that exploration. So he talked about using one club. Um, for me, I think to develop your short game, you have to use one club and you also have to practice using multiple clubs. I think going through all of those experiences are really important to be able to develop a well-rounded feel um, and to develop your skill to full effect. And it's almost then the player can make a choice as to whether multiple clubs or one club is more effective. 
certainly in the data I've gathered so far, it's probably 50-50 in terms of some of those players. Some use multiple clubs, some use one club. Definitely seems to be a trend recently with modern players to use one club. Um, I'm not sure there's one correct answer on that one. Um, and that is me finished and I've run over there, Tom, so apologies for that. Um, it was just to say as well that I have a, a workbook um, that I use on Wedgeplay. It's a bit outdated. Uh, if anyone wants to email me, they're more than welcome to, I'm, I'm more than happy to send it over. Uh, I've done a podcast with Cal Morris, which goes into some of the stuff I've talked about in a little bit more detail. And I set up launch gates for players quite a lot. And those are the uh, those are the apps on Apple and Android that I use, which uh, I use all the time. So happy to explain those uh, at a later point as well. Uh, and yeah, and I'll be doing two days, uh, possibly a course or a certification later in the year or next year. And uh, if anyone's interested, they're more than welcome to get in touch. And a quick summary quiz, but I'm not going to go through that because I've run over, Tom. Excellent, no problem. Um, I guess we'll um, we'll allocate time for guys to answer que ask questions. Um, so yeah, if you do have if you do have any questions for Stephen, please just post them in the chat option in the bottom of your screens, and I'll uh, do my best to get through as many as possible in as short a time as possible to be limited. Um, I guess I'll just start one off from uh, for me related to sort of the common theme that came out of that was focusing on one club working on. Uh, developing your impact factors, Stephen. So, what's just wondering what your opinion is on the research out there on like random variable practice block constant in relation to short game? Yeah, so I, I, to me, random and block, um, random and block practice is not really relevant because that's more about how you schedule different skills. So if you leave that to the side, to me, it's more about variable or constant practice. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think variable practice is huge. Um, you know, the benefits from a um, skill acquisition point of view is that you learn to parameterize different dimensions of the movement. I know that sounds very kind of fancy, but the ability to just to be able to hit a brand new distance or a novel distance, one that you've never practiced, becomes better the more you vary your practice. You, you develop the ability to solve the problem um, in front of you way better with variable practice so i think um a little bit more constant in the early stages of learning but then quite quickly getting someone into variable practice i think is is really important okay great uh question from jose uh if strike is one of the most important things what elements are you looking at in the swing to influence this i guess in swing pre-swing principles yeah i mean i think um some of the things that i mentioned there um Controlling the amount of lean on the shaft is very important. So good body rotation. Um, I think controlling the size of the arc is very important as well to be able to control the low point. Um, those would be key. So the you know the plane that the club is moving on, um, the path of the hands, not just in terms of the plane, but also in terms of the upward movement of the hands as well. Um, all of those factors, I think, are absolutely key to, to be able to, to develop strike. I spend... One way that I get somebody improving contact quite quickly, yeah, thinking more kind of mid handicappers, is I would get them to stand narrower usually and often take their right heel off the ground. So they're just turning around just their left foot. And that has a, a really quick way of being able to center the strike on the back of the ball uh, in a fairly quick way. Okay. That would okay. be a common, common go to drill that I use a lot. I hope that answered your question. Jose, uh, another one from James. You say that dynamic loft and strike is key. Which one would you prioritise working on first, or does it not matter? It depends on the player. It depends on the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're 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 both they're both impro important, and they both have a similar effect. Really, if you miss the, the if you know if you miss the the centre of the face by five millimetres, 10 millimetres, which an amateur golfer can very easily do. Um, that's the equivalent of delivering the inappropriate loft by two or three degrees. So they're quite similar. So it'd be, it'd be very much a person to person thing and what, what the problem is in front of me. Okay. Uh, question about, you meant there's a lot of research uh, that's been mentioned in there and it's probably quashed quite a lot of things such as the hitting the ball lower on the face. Uh, increasing spin, it's quashed probably a few um, 
myths, I suppose is the right word. Do you think us as coaches, there's a need to continuously engage with research or is it a matter of, from your point of view, what do you think is the most effective route of education to, to get rid of those myths? If, do you sort of see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I do, yeah. <clears throat> is that your question, Tom? Yeah, really, yeah. It was just yeah. out of interest. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, I think coaching's gone in circles where it was pretty much just coaches go out and try stuff and this is, this is what we think. And then in the last 10 years, there's been a trend towards, you know, research and evidence. Um, I think it's going to go back round a little bit. And I, and I think it's, it then has to be like, well, here's the research, but let's go out and, let's go out and test it. You know, um, don't just rely on stuff that sits over here in the evidence world. I think it needs to be tested. That's why I think hitting golf shots yourself and testing these things in the real world and going, okay, here's what the data says, right? I'm going to go out and I'm going to test that and see what it, and see what's actually happening. Is that usable or is it not usable? Um, so I think it's a combination. I think our practice as coaches is key, but it's also important to be informed by some stuff that sits on the side as well. Okay. Uh, question from Richard. Uh, works with a lot of beginners. Anything you generally tend to work on first? With beginners? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, with beginners. So one of the one of the tools that I use, you know, just talking at the end there about trying to set problems to solve rather than teach technique. Um, one of the things myself and a colleague friend of mine, Kendall McQuaid, came up with was the three wood wedge. So it's basically the length of a wedge, um, but it's a three wood cut to the length of a wedge. So um, when you take the visible loft off a three wood, a three wood's fifteen degrees. I mean, so if you take the visible loft off you've basically given someone the feeling of what leaning the shaft forward is. So I spend quite a bit of time with a beginner with a three wood wedge. So it's take the visible loft off and just knock the ball along the ground. And that's a great way to develop um, the movement patterns and the, the mental pictures of how they're trying to deliver the club and not have the loft interfere with, you know, trying to help the ball up into the air. Okay. So three, three wood wedge is a good one. Works well. I hope that answered your question, Richard. Uh, one from George. Uh, it's about um, focus of attention. You mentioned that you were doing a bit of research in that. Do you have any preliminary results on what's working, what's not working? Yeah, I mean, um, I do, yeah. Almost entirely external cues are what the guys were talking about. So, and I think external focus of attention is misunderstood. So I think uh, I was listening to a conversation with a couple of coaches the other the other day and they were talking about it as if external focus is the target and the flight of the ball. But that's, that's a very distal example of an, an external focus. So focusing on your glove on the back of your hand is an external focus. Your glove is not part of your body. Focusing on the club or the shaft is an external focus, but it's close enough to the body that you can evoke changes in movement patterns without thinking about the body specifically. The ball is an external focus. So, Focusing externally doesn't need to be way out there in the distance. So, yeah, so they were talking largely about external cues, um, the target, but also the delivery of the club. So the movement of the club, which is an external cue as well. Nobody was really referencing their body movements, which was, um, which was interesting because it was very different. Most of them reported a very different experience of, of how they learned the long game which was heavily internally driven, quite heavily coached, and much more variation in, in um, form. So does that sort of lead on to the fact that there's a lot more, um, I suppose, self-discovery in some respects, because, because it's overcoached, long game, short game, is leaning more towards uh, putting more onus on the player themselves rather than the coach? Yeah, I mean, definitely it points more towards self-discovery, guided discovery in short game. Um, does that work in long game? That's a question that I would ask, you know. I so mean, it kind of worms up that one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. Maybe self-discovery is more, um, is, lends itself more appropriately to the variable, the, you know, the infinite variations of short game. Yeah. I mean, less, so for, less so for long game, or maybe not. I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting question to, to look at going forward. I think it was um, related to that. It was an interesting point you made about how you have changed your focus from 
the cones to strike instead working on strike and then maybe the, so reversing the procedure I mean thinking back to when I was uh, learning and you know, I was always taught the technique first and I went away and worked on it myself so it's probably um, I guess it depends on what environment you're in but ultimately um, it's interesting that people work from cones first and then and strike is almost disregarded at some in some respect. yeah it's like there's a big emphasis on the speed of the club and speed would always get the blame so I, I would ask players I could see the impact wasn't quite right and the ball would fly too far and I would say what what will you do next what are you going to do on the next shot and it's like I'm going to hit it softer and it's yeah. like okay well the speed wasn't really the issue it was the fact that you de-lofted it too much um or um, or if it came up short, for example, it was more to do with the impact rather than the, the 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 speed that the club was moving at. But that always seemed to be the thing that got the blame. Yep. Okay, uh, we're probably running out of time now. What I would say is if you do have questions for Stephen that have gone unanswered, if you just drop me an email, Stephen, I'm sure. Are you okay um, for me to forward those on to you and if anyone wants? wants yeah. To no problem. Uh, my, my email is up there. If any of the guys want to email me directly, I always enjoy talking about this kind of stuff. So that's I'm more was, than welcome to get in touch. There was a couple of questions like for about your accreditation and that sort of stuff. So yeah, if you have any questions, do please uh, email Stephen or email me tb at cpg.golf and we'll try and uh, get those answered for you. Um, as we said, uh, apologies if anybody didn't manage to uh, get in on the webinar at the start. Sorry for that, but we have recorded it and we'll e we are going to email this one specifically out to everybody. So if you are um, subscribed onto the mailing list, you will receive that at some point later today. And as always, we do record them and upload them onto the hub page afterwards as well. So you can always go back and refer to that. But we had a really good turnout today, over 100 participants, which is excellent. So thank you very much for all attending. And thank you to you, Stephen, as well, for giving up your time. I uh, really, really appreciate it and hope you all sure. learned a little bit as well from it. In relation to the next uh, webinars, we have one tomorrow with Johan Hamp and Jonathan Manny focusing on life after COVID-19. Uh, then on Thursday, we have a really special one. We've got Jose Maria Olafabel, um, who's uh, going to be doing, well, it's a pre-recorded webinar um, where Ken Schofield uh, discussed uh, various things uh, related to his career a couple of years ago. That's at eight o'clock on Thursday night, Central Eastern European time. And then Friday we have, um, we touched on it a little bit today actually, uh, in terms of practice, structure, training uh, with Adam Young. So um, that's on Friday as well. So hopefully we'll be able to see you all there. Once again, thank you all for attending and I hope you have, all have a fantastic evening. Thanks, Tom.